In this video, I'm going to react to Netflix tech stack from a cloud architect's perspective. I'm going to dissect the tools they use, the architectures they've built, and the decisions they've made. And also, I'm going to try to give you a sense of why they have made these decisions, these choices, and what you can learn from them. But first things first, I got to give props when they're due, because this thing here is a masterpiece. Each component is a superhero in its own right. And kudos to Netflix team for making them work together to deliver the epic streaming experience we all know and love. My name is Ilyas. I'm a senior transformations architect. Now let's do this. So let's start with the DevOps side here because Netflix is a pioneer in the DevOps movements. They have been doing it since before it was cool. They've got a culture of freedom. They've got a culture of responsibility where developers are responsible for the code they write. And like, you know, many organizations where you'd find a separate DevOps team where, you know, developers would write the code and then they throw it to the DevOps team and then the DevOps team take care of deploying and monitoring. Netflix is different, you know? Developers are empowered to deploy and manage their services in production, which, in my opinion, contributes to Netflix's ability to innovate and to move faster. So we've got the classics here, right? We've got Jira to track issues. We've got Confluence to, uh, that serves as a collaborative workspace for documentation. We've got Jenkins to automate the building, testing, and deployments of code. You know, I'm not surprised here. You find these tools in every organization nowadays. What's interesting though, is that Netflix has built their own tools to manage their infrastructure, right? They have got Spinnaker for continuous delivery. They've got Eureka as a service discovery and load balancing. They've got Netflix Zool for routing, monitoring, basically acting as an API gateway. And they have open sourced these tools, which is pretty awesome. The main learning I want you to take away from this section is, I know we just started, right? But I want you to think about how scaling is hard. Scaling is a journey. I'll say it again, building something that works is super easy. You just pick and choose um, services from your own favorite cloud provider and you know, you're done. But for a company that's growing at an exponential rate, plug and play tools, they just won't cut it. You know, Netflix didn't invest time and money to build yet another API gateway like Zool just because it's fun. Individuals do that, you know, as individuals, we sometimes find ourselves spending a weekend building something, learning something for fun, but organizations don't. Organizations invest in tools because they need them. I'm quite sure they did it after reviewing everything out there and realizing that actually nothing fits their needs. Now, the other side of this, which is equally important, don't go jumping on introducing tools like Spinnaker and Eureka and a bunch of others to your organization just because they're cool or just because Netflix uses them, you know? you got to first make sure you need them. In other words, you need to be at the level where you're facing the same challenges Netflix faced. Otherwise, you are just adding complexity to your infrastructure and you're better off uh, with the simple solutions. Okay, let's move on. We have here Gradle, we have uh, Spring Boot. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Spring Boot has become the standard choice for building microservices in Java and rightfully so, in my opinion. You know, it's it's a mature framework, it's super quick. And Netflix also uses Gradle here for their build automation. Um, they've even built a set of plugins around it. They call it Nebula that you can see here. And it's, it's a set of plugin that enhances the build processes for GVM-based projects. By the way, you see the pattern here, right? Netflix is not just using tools, they're building tools. They're not just 
consuming, they're actually contributing, and that's a great mindset. Netflix did not just establish itself as a tech giant, you know, just like that. They've, they've put in the work, they've built a culture around it. Okay, so two things are left in this section here. There's the Chaos Monkey, and there's Atlas. And I wanna go back to Chaos Monkey just a bit later in the video because it's a part of a bigger picture I'm very excited to talk about. And Atlas is, I would say, yet another monitoring tool that Netflix built to monitor their AWS infrastructure for whatever reason. I couldn't find it in their engineering blog, but maybe you can and you will share it with us in the comments. Also worth mentioning that Atlas is open source. Okay, now we get to the part I am most excited about the Netflix API, the backend. This is where the magic happens. This is where the rubber meets the road because Netflix has built a set of APIs that are used by all their clients, whether it's mobile clients, front end, TV, you name it. And I can see three layers in their backend or in their API architecture there's the services layer, there's databases and then there's the messaging slash streaming. For services, they have got the playback service, recommendation service, search service, user service, and many, many more. Netflix obviously took the decision to go microservices and they exposed these microservices behind Zool, the API gateway we talked about just a little bit earlier. But the question I have, or the question I had when I first look at this is why would Netflix use GraphQL over REST APIs? I mean, you know, just you can go to the GraphQL marketing material. It's full of why you should use it and you can read that on your own. But as a solutions architect, the only valid use case I can see here for GraphQL is the fact that Netflix has a lot of clients. Web, iOS, Android, apps, PlayStation, Xbox, basically they have a, a client for every OS under the sun and each client is different, you know, has different requirements. So with GraphQL, they can expose a single endpoint and that can be used by all their clients and each client can request and only get the data it needs. I wouldn't use GraphQL for anything else though. Because, you know, it's, it's a complex beast and it's not easy to get right. That's just my opinion and I'm sure Netflix has got a team of experts that can agree or disagree with me. On the second layer, we find databases. And Netflix seems to have chosen the purpose-built database philosophy I just wish everyone adopts. And it's, it's very simple, folks. Databases are relational, key value, in memory, documents, wide column, graph, time series, and ledger slash blockchain. So please stop using MySQL or Postgres for everything. Your day-to-day -day data, your analytics data, your archives. Cloud providers like AWS already offer all kind of databases you need. And Netflix seems to be doing, you know, just that. I see here, my sequel um, that Netflix probably used to store actionable data like user profiles, like user configurations. Although I highly doubt Netflix is running the out of the box MySQL, they're probably tuning its performance locally or even using a custom build like Percona, which again, according to the, to the uh, marketing material, it's a drop in replacement for MySQL that's five times faster. I've had the chance to use it before. I don't know about the five times faster, but it's definitely fast. Okay, what else do we have here? I can see Cassandra. All right, and I suspect Cassandra, it's for the recommendation engine. You know, it's it's a NoSQL database that's optimized for write heavy workloads. Um, a good choice for something like recommendations engine because it's, it's, it's designed to handle large amounts of data across many, many commodity servers without any single point of failure. And you might be thinking, why not use a managed service like DynamoDB? Why not use Redshift? Well, I don't know, folks. They most probably tried it and it just didn't work for them or maybe it was too expensive at their scale or maybe they're using it and they, I just didn't see it in their engineering blog. But the point is, 
they have chosen Cassandra, an open source database that they can run on their own infrastructure. And they've been happy with it, you know, and, and knowing how Netflix approaches things, I won't be surprised if they submit a paper into the Cassandra Summit next year talking about how they've internally optimized Cassandra 10 times or something, you know, that, that's just how they roll. Okay, so what else do we have here? There's EVCache, which seems to be their own flavor again of Memcache that's specifically tuned to be hosted on a cluster of EC2 instances. No surprise for me here. In the Redis versus Memcache war, Memcache is the clear winner when all you need is a key value store. You know, Redis only makes sense if you're planning to use its extensive lists of features and data structures, powerful features by the way. But if you're not storing hashes and lists like Instagram does to generate their home feed, and you're not doing operations on strings in memory using bitmaps, you know, if all you need is a key value store to cache data, avoiding to hit database every time there's a client request, I highly recommend you think about Memcache instead of Redis. Plus it's multi-threaded, you know, which means that you can handle more operations by scaling up compute capacity not by scaling up memory uh, capacity like Redis. But anyways, mem uh, compute and memory are kind of commodity, but memory is still more expensive than compute in this day and age. You know, Memcast versus Redis is a topic for another video, I guess. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do that. And next we have CockroachDB, which I suspect is for the billing system. CockroachDB, after all, is a distributed SQL database that is designed to be scalable, survivable, and strongly consistent. Emphasis on the last part. We've discussed in this video the difference between eventual consistency and strong consistency, and we've specifically used the Banking system for the latter, you know, as an analogy, as an example. So it's a good choice for a billing system because it's, it's designed to be always on. It's designed to be resilient to failures. That's why they called it cockroach, you know. If there's a nuclear winter or whatever, only lizards, which are basically tiny dinosaurs, and cockroaches will inherit uh, this earth. But basically, I'm sure Netflix has got a lot of billing data and they need to make sure it's always available, it's always consistent, and you know, all that good stuff. So CockroachDB just makes sense. And we get to the messaging and streaming. Here we have Kafka, we have Apache Flink. No surprise here. Netflix seems to be using Kafka for their messaging needs. It would 100% be my go-to platform for distributed streaming that's designed to be full tolerant, scalable, and fast. And by the way, AWS offers two solutions in this realm. There's a managed Kafka version called MSK, and there's Amazon's kind of in-house take on streaming problem called Amazon Kinesis. Uh, Kinesis has the advantage of being fully managed. It's designed to be integrated with other AWS services. For example, you can attach a Lambda function to the stream and it will automatically run every time an event is published. Very powerful stuff. But Kafka is Kafka and it's got a huge community and it's got a lot of plugins, and it's got a lot of features, and it's got a lot of everything. Now, what would Netflix use Kafka for? Well, they obviously got a huge amount of events to process, and they need to process them both in real time and at scale. So I'm sure they're using Kafka streams for this. By the way, events can be user interactions, billing events, monitoring events, login events, and everything else you can think of, say, you take your remote control, you open Netflix, and you click on a movie, that's an event. Say you pause the movie, that's another event. Resume the movie, finish the movie, rate the movie, share it. Those are events that get published to Kafka, which redirects them to the appropriate uh, microservices that needs to process them, or according to what I see here, to a data lake for further analysis, which is something else I want you to take from the video. Do not run analytics queries on your main database. Please, it's a, bad, it's a bad idea. You're going to slow your main database. You're going to slow down your applications. 
Some queries are just too heavy to run on a transactional database and you need to offload them to a data lake or a data warehouse or a dedicated analytics database or whatever we call these things these days. You know, some people would try to circumvent this by creating a read replica and giving access to it to their data science team to run the analytics queries on it. Still, not a good idea. Separate your transactional data from your analytics data. Publish your application events to a messaging system. You know, you know what? Let me show you. Here's an example of what you want to do instead. You would have your application or applications publishing all events, play, pause, skip forward, whatever. And then you would have a central entity that captures all these events and cleans them, you know, a microservice uh, that can clean them. Uh, it would act like your, I would say, anti-corruption layer, if we want to use that kind of terminology. And then you would publish them to a central distributed messaging system like Kafka, right? All the events from all microservices are going to one data stream which then writes all this data into a data lake, something like S3. It's what you see here, something like, like Kafka writing directly to S3. And then once the data goes to S3, then it is organized so your data team, your data science team can perform all the analysis on it that they need, generate results, and put them in a data warehouse, something like Redshift something like Apache Iceberg, which is a database that is specifically built for analytics data. Maybe you want to use a time series data uh, database. And then you would have your dashboards, your reports, your workbooks, whatever, reading directly from the data warehouse, consuming data that has been cleaned. So they don't have to do 10 queries here. It's one query, give me the information from this time to this time for this user for example. That's it. This is what I usually have in mind when I say expensive reads versus cheap writes or cheap reads versus expensive writes because here, yes, it's taken us time to write to the database and do all this processing here. But once the data is in the data warehouse, our application is blazing fast. One query. By the way, this can be a DynamoDB table, right? But, you know, this is just a tool one query with one ID on one index and you get all the information rather than having to query your main database and having to do 20 joins, it, it just becomes a mess, you know? And cleaning events can be also part of Kafka. Kafka does real time uh, processing. So this cleaning and why cleaning also, uh, I forgot to mention this is, Maybe you don't want your data science team to have access to personal information, addresses, names of your customers, billing information, credit. Like you are sharing, think of it as you are share, your microservices are sharing this data with the data science team or, or they're making this data available to other microservices, other teams. So you wanna clean that data and only give them what they specifically need. So from a governance perspective also, you're not opening the door to everyone to have access to everything. Let's go back to the video. Personally, I'm a big fan of ClickHouse. I've used Redshift, I haven't used Apache Iceberg, but I think ClickHouse are even twice as cheap as Redshift. And I've had instances where I ran queries on tens of millions of rows in milliseconds. And I was not even using production hardware, I was just using the uh, the, the cheapest hardware that they give you in their first tier, you know, just 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 my two cents. And that's it for the Netflix API. I hope you learned a thing or two from it. Now, next section is going to be about streaming, where the magic of delivering high quality video contents to millions of users worldwide happens. And I say magic because Think of it, you'd usually be sinking into a couch, it's 8 p.m., you know, snack in hand, ready to hit play on your favorite show, and expecting a lossless, uninterrupted stream of the highest definition, and we'd be like, yeah, that's, you know, that's normal, that's just expected, that's how it should be. But in reality, it's not that simple, it's not that easy, and it's absolutely not cheap. You know, how Netflix processes and delivers video content is brilliant, to say the least. I've had a chance to work on a small, tiny part of it, and I'm going to talk about it in the next video that you can watch just here.